All right, let's talk a bit about the 1980s, a period famous for its excess over here in the US, but certainly at least as much so, if not more so, in Japan. And this is where we really need to take a step back and look at overall culture. The 1980s was a period of great expansion of the Japanese economy. It was just accelerating and accelerating at a tremendous rate. Uh, and that meant that there were a lot more opportunities for animation. And one of the first signs you see in that is Super Dimension Fortress Macross from 1982. This is another mecha series and certainly building on the success of Mobile Suit Gundam a few years earlier. But Macross did a few things differently. One of the big things was to focus a lot more on the romance and the relationships between the characters and to have a story that has a lot of appeal to a wider audience. Now that anime had been around for a few decades, folks were willing to uh, watch a show that was more complex. So besides just the big action set pieces, you also have romantic scenes between characters, bringing in both a male and a female audience. And this was helped by the fact that those action sequences were stunningly animated. Macross got a really, really big budget compared to other anime at the time, and so as a result, uh, the action sequences and the mecha uh, combat in Macross are stunningly high budget. I mean, they definitely uh, match up to animation today. And that was really a, a surprising thing. People were used to the cheap animation of prior anime series. Because of Tezuka's curse, because of those cheap budgets back in the early days of anime, people thought that Japanese animators couldn't draw high budget animation. And Macross really put the lie to that and really showed that Japanese animators were capable of really high budget, really gorgeous looking animation sequences. And a lot of people watched Macross. Uh, Macross really was a big deal, even among non-otaku circles. Really everyone was, was aware of this, this uh, anime series when it came out in Japan. And it really helped to elevate the uh, the view of anime, a theme we'll see throughout the decade. Um, and then a year later, we saw a really important uh, uh, innovation. Dallas was an anime from uh, 1983, at least started in 1983, that was released direct to video. So instead of going to movies or on television or whatever, uh, they got financing and then would just go to the fans and say, hey, you know, if you will ship, send us fifty dollars, we'll send you a tape of Dallas. So similar to uh, uh, modern day crowdfunding, except that they had funding to begin with, and then they made their money back through fans, you know, buying it directly. But definitely a, a really big deal because an OVA did not have to pass censorship. Um, and when I say censorship, I don't mean like there's literally a censor board, but I mean it doesn't have to confirm to a film rating. Uh, it doesn't have to conform to the expectations of a TV station. So you can put really anything in OVAs. Uh, this led to a variety of OVAs on a variety of topics, including some of a rather more adult nature in later years. But more importantly, in the mainstream, uh, OVAs could be experimental. They could be weird. They could uh, tell stories you just couldn't tell in for to a mainstream audience. They could be darker, they could be deeper, they could be more complex what you'd seen up to that point. So the OVA's market was really important in terms of broadening what you could do in anime. So I want you to imagine being an animator in the 1980s. Uh, you have a mature market full of an older audience looking for a more sophisticated fare, and you have now the ability to do that. You now have um, spaces in which you can be um, you, which you can tell more complicated stories. And you really see this build um, into the late 80s with the release of two really significant films in 1988. Uh, the first is Grave of the Fireflies. This was a film by Isao Takahara, who had been making a name for himself uh, over the previous quite a few years with his best buddy Hayao Miyazaki. Uh, more about him later on. But, um, Grave of the Fireflies is based on a semi-autobiographical story um, written about two children during World War II. And Grave of the Fireflies is serious literature. This is the kind of thing that you would get assigned reading in, in school to read this, this story. 
and Grave of the Fireflies adapts to this in this sensitive, very serious film. And it impressed a lot of audiences, both in Japan and abroad, for the fact that anime was now able to handle serious literature. Uh, this was a, really a landmark um, uh, anime film for being a really serious, really mature, sophisticated film. Uh, this actually did make the art house circuit internationally. Roger Ebert wrote a glowing review of Grave of the Fireflies you know, many, many years ago, back when anime was you know, not known for being particularly impressive to Western audiences. But suddenly now the opinion of anime was starting to change, both at home and abroad. 1988 also brought a film called Akira. Now, Akira is a major turning point, I think primarily because of its budget. Akira was the highest budgeted film ever made in Japan up to that point. Not just highest budgeted anime film, highest budgeted film, period. Biggest budget of any film made in Japan until, until later. And it shows. Akira has an extremely butter smooth animation quality to it. They animated Akira on ones, meaning every single frame of film corresponded to a, another drawing in there. Usually animation is done at best on twos, so every other frame. Uh, and this was just a, as high quality as you can get in animation. And not only was it hugely successful in Japan, it was also successful internationally and helped to do a couple of things. Um, internationally, it got people amazed at what anime can do. People watch this. And to a Westerner used to Disney-style animation, Akira was a perfect bridge. It had a style of animation similar enough to Disney to appeal to somebody who'd been raised on Disney-style animation, but it was definitely, uh, it had a, a plot and characters and so forth that were nothing like you'd see in Disney and constant explosions and very, very mature adult material in there. And so that got a lot of international fans interested in anime. It led to a, really an anime boom in the U.S. and internationally. But also importantly, back home in Japan, anime or, uh, Akira was so hugely successful that it really turned a lot of heads. Um, and this is, this, is, this is a trend that had already been going on throughout the 80s, but I think Akira really crystallized this idea that you could make a sophisticated, mature, adult-oriented anime series. And granted, this is not, you know, Akira was clearly not aimed at 40-year-olds. It was aimed at, like, you know, late teens, early 20s. But you could do that, put a lot of money into it, and make a lot of money. So suddenly now the, the purse strings were opened. Budgets were suddenly now available. People were willing to invest money in anime aimed at an older audience and expect to make some, some cash back. And this would lead to, some, uh, to a lot of works being made in the 90s, although unfortunately something was about to happen in Japan that would make this a lot more complicated. But that's the next video.